Hello again, everybody. So let's go ahead and finish up our lecture on logical arguments. This will be the second part. And normally on a lecture like this, if I was doing this in person, I would kind of take a lot of time and I would, I would make sure that, you know, I was getting head nods and people were making, making sense of everything. But because I can't actually physically see anybody over, over a video and a screen recording, I am just going to kind of fly through this and let you pause and digest at your, at your own will. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. We saw some arguments last time. We looked at it. We looked at a couple examples and you've worked on some on the worksheets and you've done made giant truth tables for them. Sometimes just obscenely long truth tables. And you found out whether or not they're valid or not, whether or not they're a tautology. I'll, I'll point this out. Whether or not they're a tautology or not a tautology. And again, remember that if an argument is ever, if it's ever possible for an argument to be false, it's invalid because the argument needs to hold true all the time. Now, this isn't the same as saying that it's a self-contradiction, that an argument has to be a self-contradiction to be invalid. It just has to not be a tautology. If you ever just don't get all truths, then it's invalid. Now, what we like to do is we like to call any argument that is invalid, we like to call it a fallacy. And the reason why we use that word fallacy is because most of the time, invalid arguments are worded so that they sound valid but in fact they're not this is done in contracts and lease agreements and i kind of keep using those as examples but um that's that's where they pop up so uh this word fallacy is just another term for invalid argument so let's go ahead and actually look first at some common arguments that are actually valid and so as i'm showing you these arguments you can sort of store these, you can write these down, you can memorize these, you can remember them, you can understand them. You can use these on, on like an exam or just on a worksheet. I'm not expecting you to have to show a lot of work if you recognize these. And, and you'll see sort of what I'm getting at after we go through, talk about one of these. So the law of detachment. If I ever give you an argument and it looks like this format, so A, if A, then B as the first premise. So remember, we've got our P1 here and a premise two. So premise one and premise two, then conclusion, and that's just B. If I give you that, then you know that this is a valid argument because it is the law of detachment. It's just sort of an argument that pops up we decide to give it a name, we call it the law of detachment, and we just know that it's true. Down here, I've written out a sort of the fully written format of that. And again, you can see we got premise one and premise two, and an if then with a the conclusion. Now, this should make sense. I, I first tell you, hey, if A, then B. Then I tell you A happens, so you know well, that B had to have happened. If I say, hey, if the sky is blue, then it's a Wednesday. And then I say, hey, look up, the sky is blue. Well, then what do you know? Well, you, your conclusion that you can come to is that it is in fact Wednesday, right? And notice what I, what I, how I did that. A and B were kind of flipped around, right? Obviously, if in real life, if the sky is blue, that doesn't mean it's a Wednesday. But I don't care. I don't care about whether or not that's true. I just care about the argument being true or false. And that whole argument is in fact true because it's written in this format. You could do a truth table for this if you wanted to. You could, you could work out an entire truth table, you know, starting off with, starting off with A, B, you know, and, and going down the line, you know, you could, you could end up doing your whole truth table and you could get this guy. So I'm kind of squeezing that in there. You could end up with that whole thing and you'll end up with true, 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 right? 
And, and I, I encourage you to work through that so you, that you can see that this is always the case. Let's move on to the law of contraposition. So I first start off and I tell you, if A, then B, that's my first premise. I've got it right there. Then I, then I tell you, hey, also, not B, there's no B, that's right there. Then I've got a conclusion. Conclusion C, and that's right there. And this, again, is always valid. If you do a truth table for this big old compound statement, you're always going to get true, 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 just every time. Now, let's think about this. I tell you if A, then B. I tell you that if my socks are blue, then my shoes are black. So that's my, what I first start off with. I then tell you that my shoes aren't black. Well, that means that my socks can't have been blue because if my socks were, blue, because if my shoes were black, then my socks would have been blue. I know I'm kind of using colors and socks and shoes and all there, but basically I'm saying if A, then B, well, I'm telling you that I don't have the, the then part of this, the second part of this statement. So that means I can't have had the first because if I had the first, I would have the second, but I don't. And that's kind of all roundabout and everything, but that's exactly what contraposition is. It's me saying, hey, I don't have the latter, so I can't have had the former. Because if I had the former, then I know for a fact that I had the latter. And that's the law of contraposition. Let's keep moving on. Law of transitivity here. So I'm going to give us our first premise, P1. Our second premise, P2. Again, in this compound statement, those are anded together. And then our conclusion, C. And this one, again, should make sense. I say, if A, then B. Then I tell you, if B, then C. You should be able to surmise that A implies C. So I tell you, hey, if I've got A, then I've got B. And if I've got B, then I've got C. Well, that just you can just sort of cut to the chase here. And you can say, hey, if I've got A, I've got C. And that works out. This is always valid. Again, you do a truth table for this compound statement, this big old ugly thing down here. You're gonna get all trues. All right. Last is the what we call the law of disjunctive transitivity. Um, kind of an annoying name there. Um, but the, the gist of it is that I start off with my first premise, A or B, and then I say, now, I don't have A, not A. Well, then what that means, so I say not A is that second premise. That means that I, I can't have had A because that's the second premise. So I have to have B because I, I told you that I have A or B, but I don't have A. So I have to have B because if I didn't, then I wouldn't have A or B. And I told you that I did. Right. So this is sort of a, a, a valid argument with an or in it. It's the disjunctive transitivity. I believe there's another name for this that the book uses um, as well. And I can't remember it off the top of my head, but that's okay. So we've seen all these valid arguments. If you see arguments in this format, you can, you can, you, you can just say, hey, I recognize that. That's the law of disjunctive transitivity. Boom. There, there we go. And, and that's fine. I'm fine with that if you can recognize it. If you can't, use a truth table and, and you know, do your truth table so that you get um, you know, all trues, hopefully. And then you're like, hey, it's valid. I got all trues. Let's actually do an example of that while we're talking about it. So let's say that I gave you an argument. I said, hey, here's an argument. And it's going to be A and B if then not B and A. That's my first premise. My second premise is not B and A if then um, let's do just A. Why not? Therefore A or B 
if then a. A lot of a's, b's, a lot of if thens, some negations, some and ors, seemingly complex. But here's what I want to mention. Here's what I want to call out to. I'm going to call this guy, uh, let's call it P. I'm going to call this guy Q. And oh, look, here's Q as well. It's the same thing. I'm going to call this guy R. And oh, look, there's my R right there as well. And oh, look, there's my P. So if I were to rewrite this in a much more simplified way, I would end up with P, if, if P then Q, if Q then R, therefore, if P then R. And to me, this looks a whole lot like that law of transitivity, right? Before I was using A's and B's here, but... In effect, it's pretty much the same thing. It has that same exact format. Let me, let me copy this over so that, so that you guys can see them side by side. I, I'm, I'm using different letters, obviously. I'm using A's, B's, and C's here versus P's, Q's, and R's. But these look like the exact same format. I mean, they're almost identical. They are identical, just except for, except for the, the letters involved. And so... This original argument here that I used, let me, let me copy it over. So I'll just copy that one more time. This argument here, I can just go right on ahead and I can say, hey, this is the, uh, this is the law of transitivity it is in fact true, um, we're, we're golden, we got it. Let me, let me clean up this slide a little bit, make that look a little nicer. So this original argument that I've got down here, sort of in its own little box, in that black box down there, that's, that is a valid argument by the law of transitivity. It, it works there. Um, just because it, it exactly follows that format and you can, you can see that right there. So I obviously too, if I gave you something like this, you don't want to like take that and make a truth table for it. That is going to be horrendous because you're going to have to do a truth table for each of these parts. And then you're going to have to do a truth table for the if thens in between them. Then you're going to have to do a part where you have this guy and this guy and then you have to take that whole thing and you have to do an if then with the conclusion. And it's real, I'm kind of laughing as I say, it, it's just a lot. There's a lot that, that you have to do there. So that's, that's not very fun. We don't really want to do that. All right, there's an example there of identifying an argument as a law, therefore being valid. And so, so just to be again clear, you could look at this and you could say, if I said make a truth table, you could just look at this and be like, law of transitivity, true, 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 done. And, and you know that it's, that it's always true because it is the law of transitivity, which is a valid argument. Let's move on to some common fallacies. We're gonna have three of them. And remember these fallacies are, are fallacies that, um, or their statements, their arguments that are not valid. So they can be true sometimes, but they don't, they're not always true. So we have the fallacy of the converse here. And so, again, I, I mentioned this last time. A lot of people do this. They start off with an if A, then B as their first premise. Then they tell you that they have B, and they assume that that means that they have A. And it does not mean that. If you do a truth table for this compound statement. You will not get all truths. You might get some, but they won't all be true. It is sometimes false. And this is the converse because it basically is saying, hey, I got my conditional if A then B. So if I have B, do I have A? And that's exactly what that converse was. Remember we have if B then A, we flip them. And, and we, in fact, it doesn't always work. We saw that, that if the conditional is true, that converse is false. 
So they're opposites of each other. So this does not work. It is not always true. Therefore, it is an invalid argument. We call it a fallacy of the converse. Which you could probably guess is coming next after we talk about converse. We're going to do inverse. And so I've got my premise one. I've got my premise two. I've got my conclusions. Put them in this nice little format there. And I start off by saying, hey, if I've got A, then I have B. So someone says, well, you don't have A, so you can't have B. And that's not true. That just doesn't, that doesn't work. And I'll let you guys come up with examples. You know, define A and B to be simple statements and write this out and see if it makes sense in a sentence format. It's a fallacy. It does not work. You do not always get true. So it's an invalid argument. Lastly, fallacy of the inclusive or. So if I give you an or statement, I give you A or B. You know, I've got A or B. And then I tell you that I have A. A lot of people think, think that means that I don't have B. But I can, I'm allowed to have B. It's basically because I'm in an or, once I tell you that I have A, that or is true. I don't really care whether or not I have B. But for some reason, some people will think that having A means that I can't have B. But it's an or statement that I'm starting with. So as long as I have one of them, I'm good. I don't really care about the other. So this is a fallacy. It's not always true. And so it's, inval it's an invalid argument. So we call it a fallacy. And that's actually all I have there. Um, I know these are kind of, there's kind of a lot here. I mean, we've got what, three fallacies and four laws. So there's seven in total. And it probably seems like a nightmare to try and memorize all these. Um, but, uh, you know, take your time with it. Rewatch the video if you feel like you need to. Um, and really, again, like I did on this example here, we're just looking at formats, right? If I give you something like this, know that I'm not asking you to do a, a truth table for this. That would be horrendous. It would be ugly. I'm asking you to recognize the format of each of these, this sort of PQ, QR, PR deal, and see the pattern in there. So you're just looking for patterns with all these laws and fallacies. And that's all for this. And I'll let you guys go work on the worksheets.